My first cadaver is sponsored by med school tutors. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, infiltrate the USMLE and retrieve a high score from its fortified test center. MSD has developed top secret tools to aid you in your quest, personalized study schedules, comprehensive high yield review, and GTM transmitters to connect you one-on-one -on -one with our highly trained exam-crushing special agents. Oh yes, in this briefcase with a hidden flamethrower. Try to bring everything back in one piece this time. Let med school tutors be part of your origin story. Together, we can save the world. My first. My first time? My first big exam. My first surgery. Oh yeah, that was crazy. I didn't know if I would stay. My first intubation. My first real patient. My first lumbar puncture. My first suture. Oh, yeah, my first cadaver. Attention grown-ups. Assuming we are all grown-ups, however reluctant, how did you know what you wanted to be when you did eventually, inevitably, possibly somewhat regretfully, grow up? I'm Faith Aaron, and you're listening to My First Cadaver. Considering that, in all likelihood, you are not Batman, or rock star, or playing center field for the New York Yankees, although maybe you are, I'm not here to judge, you probably changed your mind a few times over a couple of decades as you tried to figure out what you wanted to do or be, right? What exactly changed it? A fear of caves? An appalling lack of musical talent or athletic ability? Your mom? Or was it simply a sudden, irrepressible desire to dedicate your life to science or medicine? Maybe it was all of the above. In this episode, we follow the unique paths of some of our favorite physicians. Dr. Michael Kords leads the way. My older sister was the first person in my, I think the history of my family to go to college. My dad was a painter and laborer in New York City where he would uh, paint like buildings and stuff. And my mom was a uh, medical assistant for a, a doctor's office. And both my parents are very intelligent. They just didn't have the opportunities that I had. They didn't have anyone pushing them to go to college. So when they finally, you know, had the opportunity to really push me, you know, they let me choose my own path, but they were there to support me through it. And, uh, you know, from a very, very young age, they, uh, <laughs> I guess they wanted better for me. My mom used to take me around to houses and stuff that were really run down and, you know, be like, do you want to live there when you grow up? Do you want to live there? And I'm like, no. She's like, well, you better stay in school. You better go home and study. <laughs> she tried to scare me a little bit. From an early age, I sort of thought I wanted to do medicine. I went into undergrad, had it in the back of my mind, but it wasn't really until I don't know, maybe my second year in undergrad that I really decided I wanted to do medicine. When I was applying to med school, I actually didn't think I was going to get in. Um, I didn't think that I was good enough for medical school. So when I did get into medical school, I was like, oh, crap, all these people are ridiculously smart. Somehow I just happened to you know, get by on the MCAT because I know physics and I know the biological sciences by verbal score. We won't even talk about. Um, so I, I got in, but I, here I am thinking that all these people are absolutely amazing, coming from the best schools across the country. So I'd have to go home and really study hard every single night and really work my butt off to try to, you know, I guess – make people really think that I was on, you know, a similar level as them. <laughs> I got into medicine because um, I really love Sherlock Holmes. That's Dr. Pranay Sinha, an internal medicine resident and a graduate of the University of Virginia School of Medicine. When I just look at a patient's medicine list and I know, you know, the kind of things they struggle with, I can picture the person based on the kind of medications they take. I can pretty much anticipate the interview. I'm wrong sometimes, you know, oftentimes, many times I can be wrong, but like most of the times I, I get a lot of things right. And I think that's what's amazing about this profession is it's just, it's about studying human beings. That's what we do. One of the things that I've really got into is, is this concept of a narrative in medicine. And really as physicians, we're dealing with these different stories. And so when you come to, to me as a physician, I'm trying to figure out which story you fit into and have I seen the story before and how does it play out and how can I change the narrative with my medicines or surgeries or whatever I have. 
And so in that assessment section, what I do typically is I give people a story. I say, well, you know, I think this is a lovely 82-year-old lady who um, has dementia. And so when she got a UTI five years ago, she kind of got a little bit loopy. And because of that, she swallowed her food the wrong way. And now she has this pneumonia, which all of our labs are pointing us towards. So that is the story of this patient. And that is that is what I've seen my dad do. My father is a neurophysician and an internist. My mother's a gynecologist. So I saw them do this all my life. And I thought this was the coolest thing on earth. So that is pretty much what drove me to medicine was sort of this, this ability to sort of observe and create a narrative out of thin air. Um, and that was, that was pretty cool. I, for some reason, at the age of four, decided that I wanted to be a doctor. That's Dr. Heron Heller-Dane, an anesthesiologist and graduate of the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. And my parents got me a little doctor kit, and I loved playing with it. And I guess I didn't really know the concept of what it was exactly until I got a little older. And then for a period of time, I wanted to be the first woman professional baseball player. Then I went back to be wanting to be a doctor again. And by the time I wanted to be a doctor again, I was in high school. And I volunteered as an EMT at the rescue squad near our house in our neighborhood. And I really, really loved it. And I really love the idea of helping people. I know it sounds really, really cliche, but it's true. I was always a helper. And I really love the idea of being there for people at their time of need. And when I went into medical school, I thought I wanted to be an obstetrician gynecologist and I wound up completely in a completely different field, but I absolutely love it. And I still feel like I'm helping people. And half the time, they don't even remember who their anesthesiologist was. But for me, it's so rewarding because I just feel like at this particular part in their life, they're the most vulnerable. They need someone to take care of them, to take away their pain, to make sure they don't remember it. And the thing about anesthesia is it's a lot of sort of medicine and surgery. You have to be able to diagnose what's going on in an instant or at least have an idea of what's going on in an instant and treat fast. So you sort of think about differential diagnoses like a medical doctor, but you act quickly like a surgeon, and I really loved it. Anesthesiologists are a good, fun bunch of people. As you start talking to doctors, I think you're going to realize that there's going to be, like, certain people that go into certain fields, and they have a certain type of personality in each field. Anesthesiologists tend to be, like, the newspaper reader, coffee drinkers, you know, a little more relaxed. But, you know, still, like, inside, like, a little anal about stuff, too. You have to be a little anal to go into anesthesia, but they're also, like, kind of funny and relaxed and kind of people, too. I think the way you select your specialty ends up being, you end up finding your people in medicine pretty much on day one of medical school. You can call most people and you know whether or not they're going to uh, surgery or non-surgery. And I've, like, I've always decidedly been like a non-surgeon. Um, and on day one, like you can tell who are the surgeons and they tend to be a lot, co- and it's kind of like on scrubs, they tend to be a lot cooler in general, um, maybe a little bit more cocky, a little bit more panache. Um, and, and so my, my, one of my first roommates, he's, he's now a general surgery resident. And I met him on day one. I'm like, you're going into surgery, aren't you? He's like, yeah, how do you know that? I'm like, like you know, something about you. Um, and I've, I've always been pretty classic for internal medicine, uh, which is pretty geeky and nerdy. And, you know, and, and even within medicine, there are, uh, you know, there are variations. And I can speak within internal medicine. There's stereotypes. And, and you know, the, the scary part of, about these stereotypes is that they're largely correct. So they tend to be these people who are like, um, cardiologists tend to be kind of bro people. Uh, they, they, they're very smart, uh, but they also have very little patience for sort of long-term, na- like this whole narrative thing I talked about, they have no patience for that. <laughs> they sort of want to get to, they want to get to fixing things. They want to put stents in, they want to, you know, ablate lesions, they want to give the right meds, that's what they want to do. Uh, GI people tend to be really cool and really funny, and I think half of them going to GI just to be able to make poop jokes, which is pretty good, you know, they'll come in and say, I have a really shitty specialty, and they're right, you know, but <laughs> so, but they, they also tend to be more on the interventional side, they want to act, they don't want to sit around doing, you know, uh, long sort of workups. Uh, then the endocrinologists tend to be very cerebral people um, who think a lot and they really, they sort of, things make sense for them. 
And uh, the geeks, Hemong people tend to be really smart, really, really smart, honestly. And uh, But they tend to be also very caring people, generally speaking, and, and with a very strong inclination towards basic sciences. Uh, and then I'll talk about ID, which is what I want to do, infectious diseases. We tend to be sort of really oddball people uh, who like to have like random piece of knowledge floating around our brains, tend to be extremely liberal and, and like kind of hipsterish. Um, and most of us tend to be into global health. Ultimately, I chose ID because when I did that rotation, I just felt like I was among friends. Like they got my jokes, I got theirs. We, we like we went to the same kind of things. We talked for hours about, you know, Scherosporium apiospermum, which is if you don't know that it's it's a it's a fungus that you get when you have an accidental drowning. And like nobody cares about that apart from ID physicians, and and nobody should really. But the fact that they were equally interested in that like made me feel really happy and, and I had a glow inside. And so that's kind of how I made my decision. And I think a lot of people do very similar things. They, they, they find the people. It's interesting because I think it's a combination of two things. One is you like what you're good at, you're good at what you like, and that's science and, and math and stuff like that. That's Dr. Emma Hussein. But then one of the reasons that I am good at science and math is because I have an Indian dad. It's like completely cultural because you just can't be a son or daughter of an Indian man who will always be an engineer. My dad's an engineer. His brother's an engineer. My cousins are engineers. They're all engineers and they all like instill this severe math science training. And so you I think it's actually very cultural more than it had anything to do with me. But then at the point where, you know, I was old enough to make decisions, I still wanted it. I wanted to conquer and know a big field of knowledge. I really liked that. And I wanted to help people. I know that sounds um, cliche, but I really did. I'd like to pause for a moment here to try to wrap my mind around something that has been perplexing me. I've heard countless physicians dismiss wanting to help people in almost exactly the same way. I wanted to help people. I know that sounds um, cliche. After Emma, Sarah Coates, and Heron Heller deigned this as well, I asked them, in that order, to help me understand where this impulse comes from to dismiss what seems to be such a pure instinctual calling. When, when we say we want to help people, and, and that's why we become doctors, and I could maybe just be speaking for myself, but I feel like what we're really saying is I want to have power over illness. I would like to be able to control something for the better. The only way to help people as an adult and also still be an adult and not just like a philanthropist is to find a place of power and then act from there. And that I think is where I might be having an epiphany here, but I think that's where all of this discord happens with us because we want power over illness and power over in a good way, right? We want to be a benevolent dictator over illness. We want that. But the whole first four years are an exercise in total powerlessness. You don't even get to wear a real white coat. You have to wear this little short white coat of shame that, you know, like a dunce cap and walk around in it. So the one thing that you're trying to get, which is a, a form of power, is actually trickling away from you more than it's coming to you. And I think that's the problem, actually. Or at least I can see that in hindsight. I just think inside of our heads, we're all battling what a socially acceptable reason to do something is and what a um, less than noble reason is to do something. And I think that when you say something like, I got into medicine because I want to help people, a lot of non-medical people, first of all, will take will take something like that and they'll think, well, that's an awfully long road to go toward a pretty lucrative profession if you truly want to help people. 
there are so many ways to improve people's health that are not being a doctor. And I think only 10% of people's health and well-being can be tied back to their interactions with physicians. Whereas a lot of it is like public health and community things like nutrition and fitness. And so I think that a lot of people become doctors without realizing it because they want to be respected and they want to feel like they matter. I want to help people as socially acceptable and um, I want to feel like I matter is not really a nice way to say why I want to do what I want to do. And so I think that it's not that we just want to help people. It's that we want to help people and we want to call the shots and we want to be the responsible for when things get better. And we want to be in charge when hard decisions have to be made. And a lot of that comes down to wanting to be respected. We're leader types. We're caregivers. I do think it comes from, at least for me, it does come from a family that were helpers. My mom's a school teacher. You know, my dad has always been one of those people that would give the shirt up back to someone else. And I don't know if that is part of temperament, you know, just something you're born with or if it's something learned when you're really little. But it is, I do believe that it's, there's a pure feeling to it because I see it in my four-year-old, you know, that she's a helper. That's the doctor right there. She's a helper. She, she goes out of her way to, to make people try to feel better. She'll give a hug to her brother if something's wrong. She's the one that tries to fix things if it's broken. You know, you can already see at such a young age. Yeah. Most people that go into medicine go into it to help people, and to be part of that is just, it's just the next thing to God, you know, like the next, it's an honor, it's an honor to just be part of that. Let's go to Dr. Zena Semenovskaya, a graduate of the Weill Cornell Medical College. I actually became an EMT because there was a boy. <laughs> Why is it always about a boy? There was a boy in my high school who was two years older than me, and he was a volunteer EMT at our at the ambulance there. You can be a volunteer EMT from the age of 16. And he always had this, like, pager that was always going off. He was telling us stories about coming to car accident scenes and, like, helping evacuate patients. And it was very exciting and dramatic, especially for a 16-year-old. And I was living in suburban New Jersey town. As soon as I turned 16, I volunteered to be an EMT, and you do a class in order to get your license. It took about six months part-time to complete the class. And I just loved it. It was so much fun. And it felt really real. Um, so it was very, uh, very exciting. And I really liked it. And I found that I was good at it. And I was good in stressful situations. And then I actually ended up shadowing some doctors. And I thought that was really, really cool. I liked the idea of being the person in charge, you know, making decisions, running everything, sort of knowing what to do in all the different circumstances. And so I decided to be pre-med in college. And I guess emergency medicine was basically inevitable because when you start out as an emergency medicine technician, uh, what you do is basically, you know, like emergency medicine in the field, and then all the doctors you interact with essentially are emergency physicians because those are the ones who are in the emergency rooms. They're the first ones that you see when you get there and the first ones to assess and take care of patients. And so I just loved it, and I love the variety of things that you do. You know, one minute you're taking care of a, a pregnant patient who's bleeding. The next minute you're taking care of a heart attack. Then there's a patient with a gunshot wound. Then there's a, a little baby with a fever. And you know what to do in all the circumstances. And you're not going to be the person that takes them to the operating room. And you're not going to be the specialist that sees them in two weeks for their follow-up. But you're the one that's there that can make sure that they're not going to die from whatever is going on. You can alleviate their pain. You can make the initial diagnosis, start the workup, and then, you know, make them feel better. And then sort of get them ultimately to where they need to go. So it's really exciting in that way. It's really intense. It can also be really exhausting and draining, but I really like it. Probably my favorite story is just, like, is how I got into the field. That's Dr. Nicholas Rowan, a graduate of the UMDMJ Medical School. So I went to undergraduate at Pepperdine, which is conveniently situated on the beach in Malibu, and it allowed me to partake daily in one of my favorite hobbies, which was surfing. And it was a really good day. The waves were really up, and I went out. And after being out in the water for about an hour, I ended up taking a surfboard to the face while riding a wave, and I broke both my eye sockets and my nose pretty nicely and cut my face open, and I had to be rushed to the hospital. And two days later, I was having my orbits repaired and my nose set back into place. 
and my face sewn up. And if you look at my face today, you can't tell that I had any of that done. And I think that is the coolest thing ever. And so when I'm in the emergency department at three in the morning and somebody is, you know, they're hysterical, they've gotten in a car accident, they've gotten hit, they've gotten, you know, they've had whatever. And, you know, they're really upset and they think that their face is never going to look that, you know, normal ever again. You know, they see it. Uh, in the mirror, what they look like right now. And yeah, don't get me wrong, it does look awful. But then I can say to them as their physician there, and I say, well, you know what? Listen, I had from eye socket to eye socket, just as messed up as you did. And you can look up in my face if you can open your eyes, you know, if their eyes aren't like swollen shut or whatever. But and I can say, you know, you're going to be fine. You're, you're, you're going to be absolutely fine. There must be a moment in our internal search histories where we hit upon something that made us think or feel a certain way that we want to think or feel again. So we adjust our keywords, delve a little deeper, and realize, maybe I could do this thing. This thing that makes me think or feel this way for the rest of my life and I could be happy. That thing could make us feel powerful or smart or make us think about solving puzzles or helping people. But that thing propelling us into forward motion is also uncovering our deepest core values. Like the right pair of prescription lenses or contacts in a mirror, this thing can help us better see ourselves for who we really are, as well as provide us with the vision to see who we can become. But if you can be Batman, always be Batman. Thank you to Drs. Michael Kords, Pranay Sinha, Perrin Heller Dane, Emma Hussein, Sarah Coates, Zena Semenovskaya, and Nicholas Rowan. The My First Cadaver Team, Papa Claire Music and Compulsion Music, our Nerf Blasting Friends at Salted Stone, and special thanks to Robert Meekins, who is not a doctor. Do you have a story you want to share or a topic you want to hear about? Get in touch with us at myfirstcadaver.com. Stay tuned for episode six. And remember, don't try to fend off a troop of monkeys from your balcony, or you could become someone's first cadaver. And then if you think about it, the physical exam is such a classic physician tool. Like, you know, you can't imagine a physician who can't use a stethoscope, even though there are plenty of them. They're called ophthalmologists and radiation oncologists pathologist also and videologist they cannot use a stethoscope i don't have a stethoscope or anything like that but what am i going to do with it you know pretend to listen to lung sounds and i I never knew how to use one of those things this episode of my first cadaver was sponsored by med school tutors were your exam scores so high that kgb opened a file on you Consider joining our team of elite tutoring agents who like their drinks shaken, not stirred. Use your unrivaled knowledge, discipline, and skill to help aspiring double O's get their license to practice and be paid handsomely in return. We'll need all the help we can get to crush the forces of USMLE, Comlex, MCAT, and Spectre. Let med school tutors be part of your origin story. Together, we can save the world.